On the morning of August 1, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. I'm Sarah Ferris, true crime podcaster. And I'm Catherine Schweit, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And you're listening to Stop the Killing. So I'm so excited today to have a fr- friend of mine who I will be visiting probably next year in yeah. her home country of Ireland. Ireland. I, had to, Ireland. I have to let her say it her, the way she says it because it sounds so cute. So this is Dr. Emma Donnelly. And today on Stop the Killing, I am speaking with Emma. Sarah's been called away on a Sarah emergency. So could you <laughs> so, just yeah. please introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. So as you said, I'm Emma Donnelly. I am a doctor of clinical psychology with a master's and specialist in forensic psychology. I've always been interested in why people do what they do. So kind of 20 years on, I'm still asking people, tell me about their decision making. Well, let me ask you this first. How long have you been doing it so we get some perspective? How long have you been doing this now? So I I graduated from that 2003, Mm -hmm. always with the view of going into the forensic fields mm-hmm. and the why people commit crimes. And I thought, well, I can learn it from a book, but actually the real learning for me comes from being in the real world situation. So I took a job as a social care worker, which is working with kids in a secure residential center. Mm-hmm. Um, so these kids were detained by high court order because they were putting themselves or others at risk by their behavior. So these were like the most out of control kids in the country, the most damage the most vulnerable young people, 11 to 17 year olds. And just to clarify, like you deal with a lot of people who are in the system for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. Now I don't do that currently at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, his, you know, through your career. I have done. Yeah. So I worked with, I worked in prisons in both in England and over here in, in Dublin. Right now I'm working with children who have either been confirmed as being a victim of sexual abuse or when sexual abuse is a concern. So I work doing assessments to try and gather the information of what a child may or may not have experienced. And that information then is fed into our police force over here. It's called Ungar the Shiagana, uh, which means guardians of the peace, for those of you who, who are curious in the Irish language. so Wait, our, our, can you say that again? Sure. Uh, Ungar the Shiagana, which is guardians of the peace. Nice. That's, that's, so what my job is kind of connecting with the guards. So on Guard the Shikonis, that we, we call them the guards or a guard. Um, and then also Tufla, which is our state child and family agency. So they have the mandatory obligation of looking after children who are in care, who are at risk of coming into care or where something has happened to them. And hopefully if they have had harm done to them, that we can ameliorate that harm so that they don't then go on to become harm perpetrators. So my job at the moment is, is predominantly it's providing therapy for children and young people and their families where they have experienced sexual abuse. Maybe this is a good spot then, you know, to talk to us about intergenerational trauma yeah. and how it impacts how people respond and react in a traumatic event and how they can become violent, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. We could do a whole episode just on my thoughts on intergenerational trauma. I think it's a huge issue that isn't really taken seriously and the investment to overcome intergenerational trauma in my opinion just my opinion is going to take an investment of 20 30 years and nobody wants to put in that sort of money because petitions operate on a next term next term next term so it you know they're going to emphasize spending on something that they can see a quick turnabout and they can get a vote in again but i I really do think that it's community it's a whole society approach the whole community approach and it's going to take a long time to overcome it. One of the things that Ireland is very well known for in the States is the, the famine, which was, I think, 1847 was the worst year. And really, that's only four people ago. You know, it's like my maternal great-grandparents were, were living in Galway, and that was one of the worst hit areas in the famine. And that has an impact. If you think about girls who are born with their entire set of eggs that they will ever produce in their life, know that trauma impacts on DNA. We know that when you're in that fire flight system, cortisol, adrenaline, all those hormones are having an impact on your cell health, your DNA structure. So it goes without say, in my opinion, that 
if somebody's experiencing something, to quote a phrase I'm going to say quite often, shit rolls downhill. <laughs> yes. So it rolls downhill. So intergenerational trauma, what our grandparents have experienced, influences our parents, what they experience influences us, and so on. And so, so no, I never thought about it like that. I mean, you always think, oh, this kid came from a home where one of the parents is an alcoholic or uh, somebody has a drug issue. I never thought about it in terms of genetics. But as a forensic psychologist, I imagine that is quite your business. Yeah. I mean, what the fundamental psychological approach I take is a biopsychosocial model. Brenton Brenner came up with this. So the biopsychosocial model is looking at your biology, the social network that you grow up in, and your, your own individual psychology. So how they all impact on one another and how they play off and complement one another. So you can have two kids who grow up in the same, same family, but actually they're quite different. And that's because maybe they have inherited some different DNA from their parents. I'm not a geneticist, but we do know from a, a psychological point of view that trauma does impact on your DNA. We do know that we inherit 50% of our DNA from our father and from our mother, and they likewise and so on it goes. We also know no child is born into the same family. So you have the firstborn, they're the firstborn, their first child. So the child is the best of parents undivided attention. And, you know, resources are okay and, you know, they're excited and they're maybe young couples, they're very excited about having a new baby and it's all great, it's wonderful. And then a second baby comes along and it's a little bit different. They have an older sibling to compete with or contend with. The resources are divided in half because now you've got two kids out for whatever, calling for money and food and all sorts. Then you have another kid and another kid and another kid. So each child is born into a different family. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm a yeah. family of 10 Irish Catholics, you know, so. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So uh, where are you in the family? Third from the bottom. It's a Third wonder I bottom. turned out the way I did. <laughs> I mean, we, again, that's another episode. But, you know, sometimes when you're near the bottom, you're very resilient. Absolutely. I mean, you have to be. You've got to fight for, you've got to fight for your survival, right? Yeah, you have you to know? fight for the extra Brussels sprouts. One of the things that we're talking about biopsychosocial is when people say, well, he's just a bad seed. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like the DNA, the construction of who he is. And that maybe speaks to the intergenerational trauma. You must see in your patients and clients that impact of their background and where they come from. Probably the most important thing you can gather is, you know, what made them who they are, whether it's a placement in their family, absent parent or a trauma from the family from previous years. Is that such a massive influence? You know, I spoke about the intergenerational piece from a just a genetic point of view, which I'm not an expert in, but we know that it plays a role. But it also plays a role in terms of if you look at a family where there might be domestic violence. And so we'll go with the common conception that, you know, domestic violence perpetrated from the male partner to the female partner. It doesn't matter what way it goes, whether it's male to female or female to male. What a child who grows up in that situation learns is that violence is an effective problem solving strategy. Okay. Ah, interesting. It might not be. Yeah. Even though we know it might not be, because in the end, it causes more problems. Because if you've got a domestic violence situation and somebody calls the cops and the cops come, and then, you know, all of a sudden somebody's got a charge and they lose their job, there's a fallout from the domestic violence. But a child learns that in order to problem solve in the here and now, I can punch somebody, I can shoot somebody, I can throw a knife at somebody, I can do whatever, and it will end. Say a teacher at school finds that a child is aggressive. What I'm hearing is that that is a learned behavior. So it's valuable to look back to, to yeah, see where absolutely. that aggression comes from. Absolutely. It can be. Actually, I was listening to one of your episodes a while back. You had Professor Mark Zimmerman. in. Uh, he's the best. Yeah. So for listeners, sesh, it's season four, episode nine. And he was Thank you very him. much for plugging that. Mark so Zimmerman is from the University of Michigan. And oh my God, he's amazing. He was incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. And I was, when I was listening to him, I was like, oh my, I was so excited listening because I was like getting ideas going. But he talked about <laughs> Albert Pandora's social learning theory, where you got the, the kids going in and, and the doll and they punch the doll and the kids who saw other adults punch the doll are more likely to punch the doll. It's, you know, very simply, but monkey see, monkey do. Kids learn not from what we say necessarily, but from what we what they see, right? So mm-hmm. if a child sees that mom and dad are having a fight and mom throws an ashtray at dad's head and dad fucks off and goes into the other room, 
that worked. And mom and dad are having fighting war. It's like, boom. So I'm going to go to school and I'm going to let my pencil case across the classroom because somebody is annoying me. So how do you and, break that cycle, though? I mean, you're dealing with that every day. You know, what would you say to to the parent of somebody who has a kid who's aggressive? Would you like call them on it? Like, hey. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had to. <laughs> I've worked with kids who were doing exactly that and, you know, talking to the parents about like, you know, is there domestic violence? So in my job, I have to be comfortable to ask uncomfortable questions. And it's it's funny, like I ask, I have asked the most bizarre questions to my clients because if I don't ask them, who's going to, right? So I've worked in prisons with people who have murdered, with people who have sexually offended. I have to ask those difficult and awkward questions because if I don't, who's going to? And if we don't Is that ask, the most challenging part of your job? Oh God, no, the system can be more challenging. <laughs> put, me in, put me in with a serial killer any day and I'll ask them all about what they did. That is fine. It's dealing with trying to get the whole system together to sit down with this kid and go, this kid is acting out because of what he's seeing. We need to put resources in. That's the frustration. Is the lack of resources, how overstretched everybody is, and how there's a sense of we all need to do it, but who's going to do it and who's going to take responsibility for it? Do you think that's typical, though? I feel like that's kind of how it is everywhere in the world is that yeah. The, anything that's difficult, nobody wants to be part of. Everybody just Absolutely. wants to do the easy stuff. Absolutely. Nobody wants to be the one that's accountable when that child then goes off. If you think about it, so go back again, it's generational, right? Go back hundreds of thousands of years. I don't know how for many years, but go back to when we were more nomadic, more, more tribal, whatever, right? It takes a village to raise a child, right? Mm-hmm. So the way we have set up society now, is not, it doesn't really fit with how we are as a species, as an animal. We are animals. That's that's what we are. We're okay, animals. well, explain that. Okay, I'm so curious. Explain we have that. evolved from, if you look at, okay, I, I can go down several rabbit holes here. And I've written a piece on this. It's something I'm really interested in is human beings, so homo, homo sapiens came from yada, yada, yada. Okay, trace it all the way back. We've got chimpanzees over here. We've got bonobos over here and human beings are in the middle. Okay. Chimpanzees, male-oriented, male-dominated, aggressive, two cohorts of chimpanzees meet in the wilds, they'll fight to the death for territory, right? Sound familiar? Yep, yep. Sounds sounds pretty familiar with, yeah, day-to-day yeah. events in the States and elsewhere. Absolutely. And here, yep. Over here, you've got bonobos who are female-dominated society. Everybody has a role in looking out for the younger, the vulnerable, the elderly, the sick, the infirm. When two communities of bonobos meet in the wild, they'll kind of suss each other out. They'll get a little closer. Maybe the kids will start kind of going, oh, what's over there? And, you know, and eventually they'll grow when we call a larger community. Safety in numbers. Sound familiar? And so humans are a mix of both of those. So if you look at the, the chimps, if a young chimpanzee acts out, they will be met with violence. Right? Male dominated. They're an aggressive species. And they keep other chimps in their trying in check by violence, control, inflicting pain, you know, getting the younger chimps to do what the alpha male needs them to do. Mm-hmm. In the bonobos, you've got somebody who acts out, and the older but still immature bonobos might step in and take a parenting role. And so the whole community will help that bonobo to learn, actually, that's not okay. We don't do it this way. This is how we do it. And that's how human beings used to be. When I grew up, if I had done something and my friend's mother had seen me doing something I wasn't supposed to do, she's going to call me in. And I'd be like, I'd go home and complain to my mom or dad and they go, well, what did you do? You you know, if you get scolded in school, you go home and, and your parents are saying, well, what did you do? Now it's gone to how dare that person speak to my Johnny like that or my Mary like that. So we've lost that kind of community parenting, I think, in modern day society. So the way we have evolved in the Western world societies, we have evolved beyond that kind of community approach. And I think it's a real risk factor for future violence. We're we're making like a rod for our own back. If we don't parent children when they're children, we need to parent them when they're adults. And we do that by the criminal justice system. So are you kind of positing that Every child that you deal with in the system has that same biopsychosocial background that has some things in it that 
uh, have put them there that in some cases we could have maybe caught ahead of time. Absolutely. I think with everybody, there's a point where interventions could have happened that they didn't, that could have sent somebody on a different trajectory. So then is it one and out? How do you reverse the directory? If the intervention didn't happen yeah. and now you're dealing with them, yeah. how do you reverse that? Yeah, that is the $64 million question. It's like, how do you deal with it? You do at the moment, the way it's dealt with, from, from what I see, is it's dealt with by putting all of the responsibility on the individual. When, in fact, I think some of the responsibility needs also to be put on society and systems and governments. You know, poverty begets poverty. And I'm not saying that everybody who grows up poor is going to become a criminal. But you are statistically far more likely to end up in the criminal justice system if you come from a poor and impoverished area. If, you know, in the US, I know black and ethnic minorities are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Here in Ireland, it's the travelers are overrepresented in the criminal justice system because they are deprived. They're deprived of education, they're deprived of resources, they're deprived of supervision, you know, and and then that's even without factoring in that intergenerational piece. Yeah, who are the travelers? Travelers, they have been deemed as an, a, a, an ethnic minority group, a recognized ethnic minority group in this country of late. Nobody really knows the true origin of where the travelers originated from. It's like they're like the Romani gypsies. They would be would have been called gypsies in the past, itinerants. It's very derogatory terms that they would have been, would have been used to describe. Yeah, I think here in the States, sometimes you, you hear that term gypsies. They're traveling yeah. gypsies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they have been disenfranchised. They've been kind of ostracized from society, from community. And so now they're recognized as a, an ethnic minority and that's protected. Mm -hmm. But they are overrepresented because a lot of them, they didn't go to school because they didn't have a permanent home address because they were living in a caravan on the side of the road. So because they didn't have a home address, they'd move around. A lot of them were seasonal workers would go from different, to work in different farms. So they had different jobs and would move around. So they had no permanent stress. The kids didn't go to school. Right. And now it's changed where, the, you know, the, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's a greater percentage of them finishing school, going on to third level education, which is fantastic. But they're still overrepresented in the criminal justice system. It makes sense. If you come from poverty, you don't have the advantages of school or yeah. you don't have the advantages of social programs. You know, one of the things they're providing here, I, and, and it's funny, but I actually heard some people asking, well, why do they do that? One of the things that they're providing here in many states now is mm -hmm. breakfast and lunch for kids, breakfast. not just yeah. for the poor, but for everybody. Yeah. Everybody yeah. gets breakfast and lunch because they Absolutely. feel that there are so many people who might fall between the cracks on that. And I grew up in a challenging financial family situation. Yeah. You know, I didn't eat a lot of times a lot of food. There was a reason why I was thin when I was young. So I've made up for it in my older life. We have violence in the United States. Yeah. You know, and people say, well, that would never happen in our neighborhood. He's mm -hmm. never done that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you hear that. I hear that with Absolutely. parents as an FBI agent. I heard that all the time. And yeah. so, so it's not just like the, the really disadvantaged uh, families who struggle, obviously. There are, are people from all economic uh, worlds, all social environments where people commit uh, traumatic things, commit crimes. So how do you convince people that they have a kid who could be a danger to himself or others? Or, or to, how do you convince people to change their behavior to yeah. influence children in society and other adults around them? Again, another $64 million question that we could have a whole series on. Basically. But you do it one at a time. And I think that's so admirable right. because everyone <laughs> needs to be done. You reach people, as you say, you reach them however you reach them. And in all of my time working in the prisons or in, in, in England and in Ireland, the value system that people hold is similar. It's how they execute their behavior to achieve those values is different. Oh, and that's where the social aspect comes into it. You know, you talked about your own background and growing up and sometimes you went hungry and you overcame that. That's due to your individual resilience, but also it's, you know, the social environment that you grew up in that maybe hard work was recognized and rewarded. And it's like you put the effort in and you get the rewards. 
you know, one good adult can be what it takes to save somebody. Right. I Who believe that. I can do all of the interventions in the world with a child, whether they're coming to me in my hospital setting that I'm working in now, or whether it's the grown up child in an adult's body in a prison setting. You can do all of the interventions you want with that person. But if they're going back out into a high risk situation, yeah. you're setting them up to fail. So that's where the community needs to come into it. And actually, in the risk assessments that I've done, for both for violent offending and for sexual offending, you know, the, the release into a high risk situation can increase somebody's level of risk. So, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And we need to name and shame and all these people who have sexually offended against the children, which get them out on the internet, tell your neighbors who they are. Right. Really, do we need to do that? Should we maybe think about another way of bringing them into the community, not ostracizing them? Because you ostracize somebody, you're disconnecting them from potential pro social supports. And therefore, oh, potential. interesting. All right. Yeah. So, talk to me about sexual offenders. Can you myth bust a little bit about offenders yeah. and sexual offenders? Because you work in that area right now, and that is such a, a type of violence that I think people don't know a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people think of sex offenders as them monsters. Over That's there. what I mean. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They're not, they're not. They, yes, what they have done can be monstrous. But they are not uh, a different group to us. You can't say all sex offenders are the same and they're all over there and we're over here. You do that, you run the risk of missing out the signs that somebody has the potential to sexually offend. So I think that's the biggest myth is there are no difference. Whether they've been convicted or not, people who have committed sexual offenses on other people look like you or I. Look like our husbands, our sons, our, our daughters, our cousins, our uncles, our aunties. And quite often they are. Sexual offending, I think it may be the, the, the one type of offense that literally crosses like class systems, age, gender, everything. It is wow. far more prolific than we understand it to be. Yeah, you don't hear a lot about it. It's like a hidden crime. Yeah. And children certainly are far more at risk of sexual violence from within their own family or, or support network than they are from stranger danger. And yet, stranger danger is what leads. A child is abducted walking home from school, whatever. It's so scary. It's so out of the ordinary that everyone's like, oh my God, oh my God, we need to. But actually the chances of that happening is so slim compared with your babysitter, your soccer coach, your parish priest, your headmaster, your auntie, uncle, whatever. Sexual violence is far more common within the family setting than it is out in the street and being abducted. That's frightening. Maybe that's why people yeah. don't want to talk about it. It's pretty scary. Right. And I think one of the ways to overcome that is to, to know what those risk factors are. Basically, in order for an offense to happen, an offender has to overcome obstacles that they have within themselves and that the, the child or the potential victim might have. Right. So a child who is poorly supervised and that could be because their parents are in prison they're working three jobs to put a roof over their heads they have mental health difficulties they have substance abuse difficulties they have intellectual disabilities what if the parent just trusts these yeah. people right they, you know, well he's a good guy yeah, he's so my they, son's they're, they're, baseball coach so they lack that kind of oversight super supervisory kind of role and they trust everybody and yeah, that can be a, a, a way that people who sexually offend against kids can get access to those kids is uh, you're kind of hitting on grooming, you know, that uh, somebody will ingratiate themselves to the child and to their family. Right. Uh, but if a child is resilient and knows this touch is not okay, or this person is asking me to do something and the child is able to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Or the parent is going, why is he texting my kid outside of the group? Like if there's a, say, a soccer team and the coach is texting everybody in the soccer team, but all of a sudden he starts texting the one kid. Why? Are they, what, what's going on here? Or why are they always being selected? Something out of the ordinary. The, you know, the, the child is spending too much time with, with adults or with, you know, people who are much older. Riding in their car. Yeah. Well, yes, if it's on their own and it's happening all the time and it's only ever them. Or, you know, they go out of their way to drop child X home last, even though they go past their house. Why mm -hmm. is that child always the one who's 
getting out last. Oh, it's because, you know, we're really close. Why have you got such a close relationship with the child? Is there an emotional congruence to a child? Not everybody who sexually offends against a child is a paedophile. And not all paedophiles will sexually offend against a child. Hmm. Pedophilia in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, pedophilia is a sexual preference for children. And that is children pre-puberty. So some people will have a very strong sexual preference for children. They will never lay hands on a child. They will never look at child abuse images. They will never, you know, do anything that would constitute a sexual offense against a child. Some people would prefer to have sex with an adult, but because of various different situations, they can't, they're blocked by it. So they develop an emotional congruence with the child and then they can sexually offend against the child. So they have a sexual preference for adults, but they can be sexually aroused. They have the capacity to be sexually aroused by a child. Hmm. So I think it's an important thing to know. And the, the word paedophile is bandied around like psychopaths, right? Right. It's got into the psyche of the, the lay person without clearly being understood. Uh, That's somebody fascinating. Who's, yeah, somebody who's actually vents against a child who has gone through puberty is not a paedophile because a paedophile has a preface for the non-developed child. So it's some, a child who has not developed secondary sexual characteristics. Mm -hmm. Right. So majority of people who sexually offend, majority them probably won't do it again because it's a situational piece. However, there are some that will, and there are some that will no matter how many interventions are, are put into place. Mm -hmm. And it's important to have a really good, robust risk assessment done so you can know who are the people that are likely to re-offend and you can invest the resources into them. So you have somebody who's got a higher level of risk of reoffending. They need the interventions. Somebody who has low risk of reoffending. It happened because of a situational thing. It's unlikely. Let's say somebody who sexually offends against a stepdaughter or a niece, and it happens because they, their wife is suffering with whatever and is not there, and the young person who is a sixteen, seventeen year old comes over to stay. That they become close and all of a sudden the adult who is in the wrong begins to see the child who's 16 or 17, still a child through the lens of as an adult. Yes. And in that situation, they do something that they wouldn't ordinarily have done. Okay. Mm -hmm. You remove one of those factors. It's unlikely that person will ever have committed a sexual offense. Ah, right? I see. I okay. see. I see. That, that's interesting because I haven't worked with sexual offenders very much. Yeah. I don't really see the, the distinctions and the, yeah. and they're not, not fine lines. I think they're just differences, different types of offenders. And, and then you have to recognize the risk factors as a longtime law enforcement officer and as a prosecutor who prosecuted domestic violence and, and things like that. It always frustrated me how confident and trusting people were that their 13 or 14 or 15 or 16 year old girl was mm -hmm. going to be in great hands with X or Y. Absolutely. Those offenses do happen. And, you know, we've gotten better at protecting kids. 50 years ago, the concept of teenagers didn't exist. A hundred years ago, seven, eight year olds were sent out to work. And so I, what I'm hearing too, is that it's really on the adults to be hypersensitive. You know, I, one of the things I always said to my girls was, uh, uh, when they'd say, well, you just don't trust me. I'd say, well, I completely trust you. I don't trust the circumstance. I don't trust the people around you. I don't have any reason to trust the people around you or the situation that you might be in. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to put you in a position where you have to make decisions and act, you know, in such a fashion when I can simply prevent you from being in that situation. And I think Absolutely. that's good parenting. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. And Kids look up to adults. I grew up fancying, you know, pop stars and actors and movie stars who were in their like late teens and early twenties. And you're like, oh my God, oh my God, imagine having a relation. And kids think that because they don't see that disparity. However, we as adults, we see the disparity. We see that uh, a 19 year old guy is so much more mature than a 12 year old kid and can use that power to persuade a kid to do something that they wouldn't ordinarily do. The adult is always the adult. It is in the child's interest that the adult always acts as the adult. And like, let's not be afraid to say the things that people don't 
sometimes are afraid to say. Kids can be sexual beings, right? It can be healthy. They need to explore, right? And kids will engage in sexual exploration with each other. And there's a parameters around that, that this is normal sexual exploration. When it goes out here, this is not normal anymore. We need to stop that. I can hear every parent going, ew, ick, don't talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. And if we don't talk about it, then we deny our kids the experience of knowing when something is okay or not okay. So like in kind of peer cases where it's like girl on boy, boy on girl, an allegation of sexual abuse, kind of think two to four years, you know, anything outside of the two to four year age difference we're looking at, it's kind of that that's not a bit, you know. Interesting. So, oh, interesting. Two to four a, years. A year old having, you know, playing mummies and daddies or playing doctors with a seven-year-old or with a nine-year-old, that, that, that's normal sexual exploration. An eight-year-old playing doctors with a 16-year-old, that's sexual abuse from the 16-year-old's perspective onto the eight-year-old. Here in the States, there's this kind of bridge of the gap between, you know, 18, you're an adult, or is there a difference, you think, between, you know, a 19-year-old and a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old and a 16-year-old, or is it the two to four years, like you said, you know, as opposed to a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old? Yeah, I mean, when, when the law is there, Anybody who's over the age of consent, who has sexual activity with somebody under the age of consent is technically breaking the law. However, a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old, they've spoken about it and it's respectful. And the adults in their family know that these kids are in a committed relationship and you know, people are okay with that. Then chances are no prosecution is going to be brought. You know, They are on a similar wavelength. A 17-year-old and a 13-year-old are never going to be on the same wavelength unless you're talking about maybe where... A 17-year-old might have some cognitive environments and they might be emotionally operating at a 13-year-old's level. However, it doesn't mean it's okay because a 13-year-old is not operating at the 17-year-old's level. Right. You know? So that's where the adults need to step in and go, okay, we get that they're emotionally immature, but we need them to be taught how to mind themselves and mind younger yeah. kids. You know, yeah. and, that, and, and we do that through communication. Yeah. They're not easy conversations to have. People need to sit down with their kids and talk about sex, what's okay, what's not okay. I completely agree with that. I think it's not done as much as it should be. I wanted to ask you this question about escalating violence. Mm -hmm. Because so often, you know, I obviously as an FBI agent have spent time studying serial killers like all good FBI agents do. And like all of us. <laughs> and the idea that, you know, uh, the classic that you hear of, um, well, first he abused animals, that it is a, an escalation of yeah. conduct that, you know, first he tortured animals, then he killed them, then he dipped the bones in acid to clean them. And then we're surprised when he becomes a serial killer and they find heads in his refrigerator, yeah. right? And I guess I'd add to this here in the States, we do have a prevalence of guns in the United States and domestic violence with guns in the homes, uh, you know, uh, people are much more likely to be killed uh, with a firearm in a domestic yeah. violence situation. Yeah. And, you know, sexual uh, assault is part of domestic violence oftentimes. Absolutely. So should people always be aware of escalating uh, violence? Yeah, I think we, as a species, take it down to that kind of animalistic level. Our, our brains operate on a reward system. So if we use violence to escape um, a stressful situation and it works as in the stressor is removed, albeit temporarily and actually ignoring the fact that it brings more stress. But in that instant, the stressor is removed. We are more likely to use violence again in the, in the future. If somebody has committed a, an offense, whether it's sexual or, or violent offense, and se sexual offense are violent offenses, they don't always look violent, but they, can, they are considered to be a violent offense. If somebody has used a weapon, in any way, shape, or form, they are more likely to use weapons in the future. The weapon use increases their, their risk Interesting. of violence. So yeah, the, the escalation, it's like people who speed. The more often you speed and don't get caught, the more likely you are to speed. Okay. Huh. And you say to yourself, I'm a good driver. I'm a safe driver. I know when I can see things up ahead, I haven't got a crash. I haven't got a ticket. So I'm okay to go five miles over the speed limit, right? 
And they tell themselves that the more often they do it, it's more evidence to suggest that, yes, they are a good driver and yes, they can spot risk in advance and they can take appropriate measures. It's exactly the same cognitive distortion going into offending, going into the use of violence. It's the same cognitive distortions that keep behavior going. And the more often we get away with something, A, the more likely we are to believe it, but B, the more likely we are to get caught. So there's a level of one of the behavioral signs you really kind of want to watch for is a cockiness. Yeah. You know, somebody who says, I can do it. I can get away with it. I can get away with it. Yeah. Nobody's going to believe you. Okay. Take it to the nth degree. And these are not the the most commonly featured in TV shows and films. You know, the sexual offender who is narcissistic, psychopathic, whatever, right? They are more likely to get away with it because they will pick victims who are vulnerable. People who won't be believed, right? They will. Target. And is that true? I mean, do you think that that's true in reality? You see it on television all the time that people pick their victims knowing that the victims won't be believed, the victims won't turn them in. That's what I was going to talk about a little bit earlier on is that there's the, the victim obstacles. So a child who is less likely to tell because they don't have anyone to tell. So they are more likely to see a victim. So if you're not listening to your kids, if a kid picks up mom's not interested, dad doesn't care, they don't go to the adult zone with the bigger stuff, right? So if a child has nobody to tell, then that increases their risk. So yes, they will be more likely to be sought out because they're seen to be more vulnerable. Uh, So yeah, interesting. It it is actually like it's a a soapism, I guess, in terms of TV and on film, but stereotypes exist for a reason. Yeah. What do you say to a parent who says, my kid could never do that? He's a good kid. Yeah. We all have the capacity to do the wrong thing in the in the right situation. You know, and okay, say I'm never going to kill anybody. But say somebody harms my family or my niece and the only way I have to protect her is to take somebody's life. I don't like killing bugs. I, I escape flies and bugs out of my house. I, I don't like killing things. But if it came to us, I know I have the capacity to do it if if I had to, because we all have, and I am no different than everybody else. We are human beings, you know, part of an animal kingdom. Survival is fight or flight and fight to the death. And we do have the capacity to fight to the death. And if we are in denial that we have that capacity, we're really kind of shooting ourselves in the foot, pardon the pun. What do I need to keep in check to make sure that I don't? If we haven't looked at our own dark side, we don't know what we're capable of. And so therefore, I think we can perpetuate that harm if we don't pay attention to the capacity that we have. The flip side of that is what you said earlier when you said one adult can make the difference. One adult can make a difference. Absolutely. If a child has one person that goes, shit, it looks like you're in trouble there. Like, let me help you with this. Or, you know, that the child can, can be seen by and that the adult keeps those boundaries safe, you know, that the adult doesn't exploit those boundaries for their own ego or for their own sense of altruism, but that they're genuinely, they care for the kid. Does it work for adults too? Absolutely. Absolutely. So just to finish, really the kind of final take-home point is the way offenders, you know, mass shooters or rapists or serial killers or whatever are presented, it's like they are different and we could never be the same. However, we all have capacity to do really, really good things, but we also have capacity to do bad things. The amount of people that I worked with in prison who went, I never thought I'd end up here. You know, people who who have ended up in prison because vehicular manslaughter. So they went drunk driving and killed somebody. One of the things is that it's a fine line that separates us and them. We are us. We are them. We are all us and them. It's not us or them, it's us and them. I think people need to categorize other people. So it's easy to separate ourselves from the person who has gotten into a car and driven drunk home and killed somebody. They are different to us. They are over here. We are over here. However, I think in, in any situation, we all have the capacity to do something that we wouldn't think that we would ordinarily do. So if we can stop seeing each other in terms of differences but similarities. Yeah. It can allow us, I suppose, to be more compassionate to each other and so there's somebody who's done something that I'm sure they didn't grow up with an ambition to be that person or to do that thing. How can I help to pull them back in? Yeah. Rather than 
cast them further out. Because we cast people further out, we're socially isolating them. We are making them more risky. So how can I reach that person? And really thinking about that kind of, kind of community and connection. How can we reach that person to help them? Because if we don't help them, we're going to cause more victims. If we do help them, we can maybe reduce the amount of victims. Oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Thanks for listening. And if you want to know more, Catherine's book, Stop the Killing, is out now. For more details, go to katherineschweit.com. Please consider also supporting our independently made podcast. It's simple to do. Go to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing. And for as little as the price of a latte a month, you can be part of the solution to stop the killing. Patreon rewards range from official do-gooder status to ad-free episodes, autographed books, and opportunities to connect with us directly for your business, school, church, or even just a book club chat. But just knowing that you are part of a movement that has the power to make your community safer, well, that's got to taste better than a skinny cappuccino any day. So please head to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing now and polish off your do-gooder halo and make sure to include your name so we can give you a shout out. This podcast is a community podcast production. That's con with an N. If you want more content, then head over to Community Podcast at Instagram, where you'll find trailers on more binge-worthy true crime, like the award-winning podcast Conning the Con. And check out our show notes for all the links mentioned. Finally, if you want one takeaway action that you can do right now that can help make our community safer, Please share, rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Everybody needs to know that they hold the keys to see something and say something. Together, we can stop the killing. It's one of those things you hope never happens, but you better train for it. Because it will happen. And it will happen in places you wouldn't expect. Be ready for it.